Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, uh, last time I visited a Microsoft Research Lab other than New England, I didn't have such a nice experience. Uh, and you'll find out a little bit more shortly. So this is imperfectly shared randomness. I'll tell you what it means in communication. Uh, this is joint work with Clement Cannon, who was an uh, uh, intern at uh, New England this summer. And uh, it's one of these really amazingly compact projects. We never had an idea that there was a question out there till he came, started thinking about this thing. Then um, we started thinking about some question and it seemed like a nice question, but we weren't very sure. And then we started talking to Venkat Guruswami, who was a uh, 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 visitor in the lab for uh, uh, the full semester, and Raghu Mekha, who's now unaffiliated, unfortunately, but he was from this, who was at the Silicon Valley lab in those days, and uh, he suddenly sort of triggered some sequence of uh, thoughts and it led to something which I consider quite pretty mathematically. This will be a pretty mathematically intensive talk where there's a few slides of general motivation but after that it's a pure core theory talk, okay? And uh, so of course I do want to dedicate this talk to our SVZ colleagues. Uh, uh, so in addition to the fact that uh, this was joint work with uh, Raghu who was uh, 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 who was at the Silicon Valley Lab. Um, the first time I was planning to present this talk was to them and this was on the day they were all told that they were all laid off and uh, uh, in a really shockingly sad move and uh, um, furthermore I mean you know when I was th this entire talk by the way I mean after I heard the news I didn't have uh, I, I just didn't want to look at these slides. I looked at it today in the plane. I just decided to add this one slide. Otherwise, it's really aimed at that audience. I was thinking of members in that group and saying, you know, what would I want to say to this person or that person? And that's why this talk was constructed. So I'm sorry this fit ends up being uh, inappropriately targeted today, but I didn't really have the heart to change it since then. Uh, okay, so that's that being said, let me move on to the uh, subject of the talk. Uh, the underlying uh, the broader picture issue that I want to address, I'll be addressing one particular very specific aspect of it, but in general what I want to talk about is context in communication. So context is a central element of communication. This is what is assumed to be shared between sender and receiver before any of the communication questions come along. And it's usually implicit. You never mention it. You never uh, talk about how large is it, how important is it, how you know, how much of it is perfectly shared or not. And uh, it's in particular when we talk about complexity of some communication task, it doesn't participate in the input parameter N. Okay, and you would just say, look, let's ignore all of that. Talk about the real new input, which is really what one of the two players has and the other doesn't and see how much time it takes to get this part of the message across or some functional aspect of it across. But it is always sitting in the background okay so when so let me start with a few examples so when you say you know I'm talking to you with a sequence of letters over the English alphabet or some such thing there's always an associated meaning to this thing but we never talk about how do you communicate that meaning we only talk about how do you communicate the bits you know, that we want to communicate in the theory of Shannon for example when you say look you know here is how you do source coding you know I sender is getting messages from some distribution, wants to compress it so that the receiver can figure it out. You don't usually talk about the distribution itself, you just assume the sender and the receiver know it or uh, work around it. The behavior of the channel, should it be specified explicitly as part of the input or not, we usually don't. We just say let's assume it's known and we build the codes. The codes that are used either for source coding or error correcting codes, we never discuss it, it's already in in the background somewhere. Now that they've been fixed, how do we do the next step is usually what we talk about. But these are the implied context. In communication complexity, the model of Yao, where I have some input X in my head, you have some input Y in your head, and we want to compute some joint function, we could ask, you know, do I really know, want to compute the same function as you, and do we know about it, each other? Okay, so that's, you know, these functions that are being computed, are they really known, and if not, how are they specified, shouldn't they play a role in the communication complexity? 
the randomness that's shared between the communicating players is it you know we just say oh there's plenty of randomness it's available but you know it's really part of the context in human communication going back to this first bullet in the sense issues like the language that we use the grammar the this the that these are all part of the context they give you know if the context did not exist in a sense we wouldn't be doing any communication it's to ex it's to really evolve this context that we really do the communication but we never talk about it explicitly and uh, it the one of the uh, sort of things about the context that makes it important that we should stress it explicitly is the fact that actually context tends to be large so in in our communication today when i'm speaking to you our shared context is the knowledge of english all the knowledge of mathematics that i rely on maybe words like shannon and uh, uh, yao communication complexity etc all of these things might share some meaning and i'm counting on all of that in order to be able to deliver a message but the amount of context that i really count on i cannot even sort of start to write it down in some finite amount of space i mean there's just huge material and you say what do you mean by shannon and i'll start writing pages of stuff and then when inside that page you might point to some word and you say what do you mean by that and then there's a further elaboration this amount of context just keeps exploding on us it's large and at the end by the way i don't need you to know this precisely and i suspect when you read about uh, divergence you called it this and i called it that and by the way you always uh, measure the divergence of p with respect to q and i measure measure divergence of q with respect to p etc i said all these things so many things could change but really nothing will change because of all of these things changing so sh context is large amount but it's shared in some very imperfect way and yet we try to build on this shared context and we communicate so this is a very interesting phenomenon in natural communication and we want to talk about it in a thing so i mean you know when you go to any one of these uh, online forms there's always some shared context there please enter your pin now which one of pins you gave me three different pins i'm not going to start entering them each one at a time I mean, that's a huge violation of security maybe but you know and you go to these forms there will be so many things they'll say please enter the image that you you know the numbers that you see in the image but there's a number here and there's a number there should i put this one first or that one first no 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 it's like you know we never tell you the rules if i see you know tell me what's the sequence of letters that you see i mean somehow we managed to figure out what they might have asked for us for and we estimate it and we give an answer according to that we never laid down in words if we had to it will take you know each one of these instructions will be longer than uh the three or four screen folds so in compression this is an example that we will come to again um, when i want to compress information just think about one short communication i have a message and i want to send it to you and i know something about the underlying distribution we can compress it if the distribution is known to me and you but how do we know that we are working with exactly the same distribution so this is a very uh, you know so do they always have to agree perfectly on the prior distribution or can compression work if i estimate that the dis distribution of messages is something you estimated it as something else and we never agreed on the disagreement on how much we disagree and where and what could things even work there so i did some work with uh, brendan juba adam kalai and sanjeev khanna on this in few years back and then later with haramathi and i'll tell you a little bit more about what we learned about this shortly and in this talk what i want to focus on is another one of these things so whenever you're talking when you you're uh, do, uh, trying to execute some protocol in this communication complexity model i'll talk about it uh, next we things can become much quicker if you are allowed to share some randomness between the sender and the receiver and a fairly natural question is you know should this ra randomness you know be shared perfectly or not and today's talk is really going to be about that particular question for the most part okay all right so sh i will tell you about communication complexity i didn't draw a very detailed description formal description of what communication complexity is for the most part we won't need it i'll sort of skim over the issue but we'll do it by an example here is the most sort of the the first question that anyone is probably exposed to in communication complexity is the following alice has some n bit string x in her head Bo bob has some string y in his head and they want to exchange messages till they can determine whether x equals y or not privacy is not a concern here they don't mind 
if uh, Alice doesn't mind if Bob uh, finds out X and Bob doesn't mind if Alice finds out uh, 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 Y. All they want to know is, is X equal to Y? And they want to exchange as many bits of information as are needed to be able to determine this, but of course they want to minimize the communication. Deterministically, it's well known that you must communicate at least n bits. This is really actually n plus 1, I think, is the correct number that can be achieved trivially. Alice sends x to Bob, but Bob sends back a bit saying, yes, it's equal or no, it's not. That's n plus 1 bits of communication. That's the best you can do if Alice and Bob try to be deterministic. If, on the other hand, they are willing to be randomized, Alice may be able to toss some random coins and then communicate something to Bob and Bob may be able to again toss some coins and then communicate ba back etc etc and they can in log n bits determine with fairly good accuracy whether x equals y or not. If x were equal to y they would probably come back saying yes and if x was not equal to y they'll probably come back saying no. The probability is purely over their coins that they're tossing. This is what is called private randomness. In case you haven't seen this, this is a very simple protocol which does this. Alice takes her input x and encodes in some error correcting code. Some code where any two code words will be mapped to strings which are different in 10% of the coordinates or something like that. And then what she does is picks a random coordinate i, let's say capital N is the length of this encoding of x. She picks a random coordinate i and says on the ith coordinate my encoding has 0 or on the ith coordinate my encoding has 1. Okay. Now, by the very definition of an error correcting code, for a randomly chosen coordinate, encoding of x and encoding of y would be different with probability one tenth or whatever. And this is going to get constant error probability. Uh, and uh, Bob basically just checks to see if at the ith location, encoding of y equals the encoding of x. Okay. And that's determines this verdict. This is correct. It has 90% error probability maybe right now. You can repeat this a few times. Get, gets, our, gets very well. The amount of communication is logarithm of this capital L, but because we have very good error correcting codes, that's the same as the logarithm of little n plus a constant in fact. Okay. So this is a very, very good error, uh, uh, communication protocol. So this is what happens with private randomness. Now we can ask what happens if you if they share some random string. Alice has some random string in her head and it's equal to the string that Bob has in his head and it's random and independent of x and y. What could they do? Well then you can interpret that random element that they have as this index i and now Alice doesn't have to communicate the index i she just communicates the encoding of x in the location i that's one bit of information and this is giving you constant confidence in the answer. Okay. So with a constant number of bits with shared randomness, they can actually determine if x equals y. So the moral of this story is, if you have shared randomness, communication complexity can dr drop dramatically. With, without uh, any randomness, you have n bits. With randomness, which is tossed privately, you have log n. But then with randomness that is, you know, shared between sender and receiver, it's constant number of bits. And this is the best trade-offs that are possible in a sense. The gap between this and this is never more than an additive log n, and this is already achieved over here in the most dramatic of ways. Without private randomness, log n, uh, sorry, with private randomness, log n bits, but with shared randomness, constant bits. Okay. So this is an interesting example. We'll come back to it later. This is one example where shared randomness helps a lot in communication complexity, but this was not our motivating example. Our motivating example was really the example of compression that I talked about earlier. And uh, that example, let me try to tell you what was the mathematical question there. So we want to do compression of information when the priors are not fixed and agreed upon. So how do you model that problem? The way you model the problem is Alice is going to get a message M from a universe of size capital N and it's drawn according to some distribution P. And let's say this distribution P is known to Alice. Okay, so P sub i is the probability with which M will equal i. Alright, and uh, so she gets 
the distribution explicitly. Now I'm putting this, this used to be in typical compression uh, context, you would never mention the distribution as input to the problem, but here it's an input to the problem. This is the context and it's an input. Bob has a distribution Q which is close to the distribution P. Okay, what do we mean by close? There are many measures of uh, distance that could make sense here. The one that we chose because it was the easiest to work with was on every coordinate pi and qi are off by a multiplicative factor of 2 to the delta where delta is some number and that measures the distance between p and q. Okay, So pi divided by qi is never less than 2 to the minus delta, it's never more than 2 to the delta, that's the measure of distance. Okay. So in particular if delta were equal to 0 then pi equals qi, this is the classical communication problem. What can you do? Well if p equals q, the expected communication that you get is the entropy of this distribution p and this is what is achieved by Huffman's coding algorithm. Okay, the very simple Huffman coding thing that you might have seen achieves entropy of p amount number of bits between. So Alice will send entropy of p many bits in expectation, meaning when m is drawn from this distribution. And uh, after that many bits of communication, Bob will be able to guess. M, he'll reconstruct it from the message. Okay, sense. Now, what we were able to show in the paper with Juba, Kana, and Kalai is that uh, when P is approximately equal to Q, then by the way, the standard compression methods do not work. Okay, Huffman doesn't work, arithmetic coding doesn't work, etc., etc., etc. And quite often people ask me, you know, isn't this somehow or the other implicit in the literature sh that you should have been able to do something reasonable when p equals as approximately equal to q? Well, the only way I know to do something reasonable is when there is shared randomness between sender and receiver. Then we can achieve entropy of p plus 2 delta. So if the distributions are very close, then you communicate almost the entropy of information. And as the distributions get further and further and further apart, you have to communicate a bit more, but still it's a very manageable, tolerable price. Okay, So you can get this, but you need, or at least this solution needed shared randomness. We tried to explore this question, can we, you know, it's, uh, this whole motivation for this question was, <coughs> excuse me, Alice and Bob do not share their context perfectly. So P is not equal to Q and they're trying to overcome this lack of shared context and to say that they can solve this by having shared perfect randomness seems to be like the really wrong solution for the problem, right? I mean, why solve it with, you know, assuming X can be shared perfectly when you don't want to assume Y is not shared, is shared perfectly. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we tried to say, well, maybe we could try to do this, get this result deterministically, and so far the best answer we have is, okay, entropy of P plus delta, but then there's another log log n coming in. That's the, where n is the size of the universe. Just to see how bad is this number, if I put in a log n over here, you should have been scoffing at this result. Why? Because I have a message from a universe of size n. I can just ignore the distribution and send you a log n bit string that that would just tell you what the message is, right? So getting log n here would have been a triviality, okay? So we get sort of a logarithmic loss compared to the trivial solution. But really, when you talk about entropies of distributions, we really are thinking of uh, <coughs> distributions of messages which may not even be on a finite support, okay? So a log log n when n is infinite is not a very good answer. We really, I mean, the nice thing about entropy is it was a clean answer, it said, measure the uncertainty in the uh, random variable and that tells you how much you have to communicate. Is this still the right answer for compression if you're really compressing with uncertain priors? And compression with uncertain priors is really much more natural when people are talking to each other. So for example, in Shannon, one of Shannon's original papers, he sort of measures the entropy of English or some such thing. Okay, So you can apply this in natural context. You can certainly measure the amount information in the natural communication, but really is the compression length measuring <coughs> the same thing as uh, the uncertainty? Is compression length really bounded by the uncertainty? It's not clear in this natural context. Not if there is a log log n, I wouldn't 
Yeah, I'd like to understand how this delta is quantified. So let's say a dictionary, you had a dictionary of words, a dictionary of an alphabet, and there are some discrepancies, some letters are missing or some words are reordered. Right. What exactly is delta in that case? So, okay, think of delta as uh, given a word, you say, you know, what is the uh, meaning that I would associate with it. So sometimes it could mean some, you know, words which have multiple meanings. Okay, and most words tend to have, you know, several different meanings depending on the context or what is the context in which you are planning to apply it might be another thing. You have many different, you have sort of a choice of what it could have meant. And you could say, you know, I mean, you know, suppose I say yes, to, you send me some email and I send you a response saying yes, but you sent me three emails in the last day and I sent a yes. Which email did I respond to? You sort of make a guess about it. And uh, I might make an estimate saying, look, obviously, you know, I ignored your last two emails and I responded to this one within three seconds of it. You would assume that I'm responding to the latest email. But on the other hand, you know, from your point of view, you might have seen the message after, you know, my response three hours later and you might say, well, you know, I sent that message yesterday, this one today, and I got the response day after tomorrow. So it could have applied equally well to the two messages. So the, this sort of, when you give a, word, a particular phrase in English or some such thing, and the meaning that you associate to it in the context, in the context of context, um, there's a certain amount of, there's a probability you'll associate with it, saying this is what I mean think you meant, this is what you think you meant, and these probabilities may be different for the sender and the receiver. Does that make some sense? Right, but I guess I'm trying to map that to something concrete. So for example, there are these dictionary based compression schemes used to networks where the sender and receiver have a shared dictionary. Right. Which <coughs> is matching. Okay, good. Uh -huh. But let's say there is some discrepancy in the dictionary because of some reordering of lessons or whatever. Right. How would you then quantify, let's say two words got reordered in the dictionary. So the, the dictionary was a solution to the, uh, I, as far as I know, that it cannot tolerate even the slightest misunderstanding. So for instance, you know, you might have said, look, we've been communicating for many days. I've been applying Lempel Ziv and it's building a dictionary online for what should be the best compression between the two of us. It may be that your dictionary missed out one email that I sent, but my dictionary kept it in the thing. Our dictionary has evolved in two different ways. From this point on, our communication could be completely bad. Okay, so as far as I know, there's no soundness associated with this kind of a process. So you don't usually associate it with the most natural compression schemes because they just do not tolerate P is different from Q. You can associate it with uh, more of human communication, and especially human communication in the sense of what did I mean to apply that particular word to? There, there's a lot of probabilities and uh, probability matchings going on. Uh, Naveen, you had a question? Ah, right. So Braverman and Rao talked about a very similar setting. I don't think their goal was to, so they, they had P and Q which were different. Their goal was to sample from distributions P and Q with probability sort of roughly matching P and Q, I think, something along those lines. Uh, the one thing that I recall over there is it's an interactive setting. So they, in, the, in this case, we are looking at a one-way setting for sure. Uh, Alice sends a message, so we don't have the ability to say, well, we look at the divergence between P and Q and try to attain that. Uh, so here, this is more or less the right measure of distance that we had. And uh, as far as I know, there was no thing saying, Alice is going to deliver a message to Bob, but rather, this is how they would sample from some distribution together, I think. Yeah, it's only from Alice to Bob. It's only from Alice to Bob. Uh, yeah, we really want to think of it as one-way communication. Okay, so this was another one of the motivating examples. Sorry, so I'm getting kind of slow. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, uh, in this process, you are interested in the message, but do you get any information about uh, distribution itself? Good, good question. So, so one of the things that, <coughs> as far as I can see, you know, the amount of communication is so little that you're barely able to get the message. But a little bit extra, maybe that's been tossed in. But as far as we can see, there's no simple way of going from here to saying we've learned something about the difference between Alice and Bob and their distribution. And at least in the non-interactive setting, nothing really happens. So there was a subsequent uh, work, I don't know if it was published ever, by Juba and uh, Kamath, who looked at this and they said, well, you know, what happens if they're communicating a series of messages? At some point, 
you know, Bob Evil has enough information to learn Alice's distribution. And so should not even need to lose this 2 delta. But the time that it happens is so far into the future, like after almost n messages or some such thing. So you don't really get much benefit till then. It's not like the second message already you're getting something. So you might be learning something about the distributions, but not enough really. But if you did learn the distribution, there would be no n factor. The n should not show up. After a sequence of... Uh, right, exactly. After, so if you were sampling from this distribution repeatedly and then sending this thing, you should be able to amortize out this 2 delta. After a while, you will not see anything. But for the first 100 messages, any constant number of messages, for each one, you'll be sending 2 delta extra bits. Okay. All right, so let me march ahead. So uncertain comp compression, we can say, look, is it the right measure of comp compressibility? With uncertainty, it may not be. I mean, at least we don't know how to get this deterministically. Randomized solutions, if you're willing to by then it's saying that entropy is the right measure, but randomized in this very weird sense of perfect sharing doesn't look nice. So this really motivated this imperfectly shared randomness question for us. So what happens if Alice and Bob, just like they don't match on the distribution, also don't match on the randomness? Could they have done the same thing or something reasonable? This is what motivated our question for us. Then we started looking at the literature and Clement went to a conference, ICALP in 2014, and then he found a paper by Bavarian, Gaminsky, and Ito, which actually studies exactly the same question, imperfectly shared randomness and communication complexity. And what's very embarrassing, why I could put independently in quotes, is that Bavarian is a current student of mine. So, <laughs> has been a student for three years. <laughs> so. <coughs> All right, so uh, our model, I'll, I'll mostly stress on our model, but I'll tell you a couple of things that they did and uh, tell you what's different. So we want to study general communication complexity with imperfectly shared randomness. If you can see the colors, this I, S, and R are highlighted, and I'll be using this abbreviation in the future. Uh, so this is the model of randomness sharing. Alice has some string R, arbitrarily long, which is a uniform random string. Okay, every bit is uniform independent of the previous one. Bob has a string S where in each coordinate Ri and Si are, you know, S is also marginal distribution is uniform and it's just a noisy version of Ri. So if Ri is plus or minus one, then Si will be equal to Ri with probability something. So I think we, we prefer the plus minus one notation and here correlations are measured by just looking at the expected value of the product of Ri and Si and we'll just say that that's rho. If rho is one, it means Ri is always equal to Si. If rho is minus one, Ri is always equal to minus Si. And if Ri, if rho is zero, it means these are independent random strings, okay? So, so we'll talk about rho correlated pairs and I, Alice and Bob have an infinite supply of rho correlated pairs. What can you do with com in communication complexity with this thing? And this is the question that we're going to be looking at. So for some function, communication complexity function to be computed f, we will say ISR sub rho is the communication complexity with uh, rho correlated bits. Okay. And uh, PSR is what we will be comparing it with, which is the amount of uh, uh, communication needed for perfectly shared randomness. This is what used to be also called public randomness or shared randomness in the past. This is what we will be comparing against. And another benchmark to compare against is private randomness. What if Alice is only allowed to use randomness that she has and Bob is only allowed to use randomness that he has? And then how do things work? And just to put all of these things in a single thing, Privately, sh perfectly shared randomness is the best model. I mean, it's the one which will give you the minimum communication complexity if you have it. Uh, and then imperfectly shared randomness should be somewhere between that and privately shared randomness. You know, if, if I have n imperfectly shared random bits with you, I can look at the first n over two bits, you can look at the second n over two bits, and that's pri n over two privately sh private randomness. So certainly this inequality holds and same there. In fact, the in imperfect shared randomness, this is imperfectly shared randomness with rho equal to one. This is imperfectly sh shared randomness with rho equal to zero. And indeed in between rho zero and one, this is a monotone function, okay? Going in the right direction. 
right? So that's consistent with these inequalities. And finally, private randomness is never, uh, private communication complexity is never more than the public communication complexity plus log n. Okay, this is a, a old theorem in uh, uh, communication complexity. So this difference will never be more than log n. So this, by the way, was uh, the reason why uh, uh, Bavarian et al. actually never really studied this question. They said, well, this is not interesting. I'm only going to see a logarithmic additive gap. But from our point of view, when we were thinking about, say, compression, log n was something that we were going to be dismissive of, of, of trivially anyway. So a gap of log n is a huge gap by our sense. And in general, I think whenever you talk about this shared context, the inputs to problems tend to be large. Communication complexity tends to be small. I mean, the input to my our communication problem today is all my life experience and all your life experience, and we have an hour barely to talk about things. Okay, so communication complexity is tiny for whatever task we're considering. The context is massive. So in such settings, saying that, look, okay, I'm going to add another log of n, where n is the size of the context, is huge. So you can't afford to do that. So the scaling really has to change, and the perspective has to change. So we think this is a big difference. So you can't just dismiss this and say. So we really want to say, how much better than, than this upper bound can you do on imperfectly shared randomness? So here are some results. Uh, so Bavarian et al, they, what they focused on instead, because this thing was so bad, was they said, okay, look, we won't talk about communication in any of these classical models. Instead, we'll talk about the simultaneous message model, where Alice and Bob have inputs. They compute some sketches of these inputs and send it to a referee, and the referee outputs the value of the function. In such cases, this gap of log n doesn't hold. And so then, you know, you get still interesting questions and they focused on it here. Our focus is on one-way communication, typically actually no longer one way we can, pretty much everything that I say holds about two-way communication, but uh, uh, I'll only state the results for the one-way case. Uh, maybe I might say some other things later. So typically I'll focus on the case where Alice is sending some message to Bob, like in the compression problem, that's it. And Bob outputs the value of the function. And we are going to focus on problems. And by the way, I mean, we, when we started looking at this question, we came up with some problems which are not so standard. And uh, they were interesting problems as communication complexity problems of their own, uh, where the difference of log n is going to be significant. So this is, so what are the results? So first thing, we went back to our familiar problem, uncertain compression. What happens to it? Turns out it actually works very nicely, even when you have imperfectly shared randomness between sender and receiver. And the solution turns out is not very hard. It, uh, you know, it, it, but it's, a, it's an interesting uh, solution. I'll skip the slide which talks about it instead just try to say a line or two about it. Now, the usual solution for, uh, uh, or maybe let me just come to that slide when it comes, uh, I'll need, need the help of the slide. Uh, another very interesting thing is, this was already discovered by Bavarian et al. We discovered it independently and actually with two different protocols, but uh, uh, equality testing, the problem that I described, Alice and Bob have strings x and y and they want to know if x equals y, can be done with constant amount of, uh, constant number of randomness as long as rho is strictly greater than zero. So you Alice and Bob do share correlation. They're not sharing perfect randomness. This is a protocol that is actually non-trivial to uh, guess. Okay, you have to think a little bit about it at least, I would say. It's not a direct translation of anything that we knew about. And uh, in fact, it took a little while after we saw this to say, oh, maybe everything, you know, uh, everything that has small communication complexity in the uh, standard, the perfect sharing randomness model also has small communication complexity with imperfectly shared randomness. And it, the answer turns out to be true, but not in a simple way. In general, if you have perfect shared randomness complexity of some function is k, then it's one way imperfectly shared randomness communication complexity is at most 2 to the k. So of course, if this is a constant, that's a constant. And that's what we saw here. But the translation was not trivial. It was not going from k to k or k to order of k. It was k to 2 to the k. That was what worked it out. Yes? How does rho 
uh, oh no we are assuming rho is a fixed constant uh, between 0 and 1 and all of these constants could depend in some ways on rho it typically it's not a very bad dependence but there is a dependence on uh, rho everywhere okay. and yeah n is not in the picture but uh, rho should not depend on it so now we, we when we looked at this result we were sort of very curious can we can we really improve on this k or not and the converse that we found was uh, surprising to us initially in fact you know between these two things there was a time when we were uh, convinced that perfectly shared randomness and imperfectly shared randomness are within constant factors of each other uh, which was not true and at other times we were also convinced that actually there are protocols which just require unbounded like log n communication uh, <coughs> and that was also not true so and depending on which things we were thinking about we thought the upper bound was already giving us a stronger result or the lower bound was already giving us a stronger result but turned out the two of them match there is a function uh, more like a promise problem whose one way communication complexity with perfect randomly shared randomness is k but with imperfectly shared randomness it's at least 2 to the k so you do need this 2 to the k growth uh, you cannot get away without that uh, this has been I hope, uh, I'm not sure at this stage, but I'm, I think we're almost sure about this, that we now have this result where there is a function whose one-way communication complexity with perfectly shared randomness is k, but two-way communication complexity with imperfectly shared randomness is 2 to the k. So you really cannot hope to improve on this result in any significant way. So these are the results that I'll try to talk a little bit about. So I'll briefly go over all of these results. And so I should stop at four. I think it's okay to go beyond four. I don't know about people's schedules, but we have the room. We have the room. So maybe I will. I don't know if people are okay with it. Maybe we'll try to take up to about ten minutes extra, and then not not go beyond ten past four. But I'll. Yeah. Just yeah. Just yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 No. Uh, Uncertain completion. Uh huh. The same problem that you discussed initially, but right. the randomness that's shared is just a long string on either side, which can be very long. Right. But the correlation is rho, right? R the correlation is rho, exactly. So, yeah. But, uh, the correlation of rho, uh, but it's but I'm surprised that the length of that string, correlated string, doesn't seem to matter. Uh, so, so the the randomness is there to help you. You can of course ignore portions of it that you don't need to use. Right. So, so as a result, uh, the uh, yeah, I mean exactly. And uh, so there are times when you would be using large portions of this shared randomness. When you have a very unlikely message, you'll use large portions of the shared randomness. When you have a very likely message, you'll use small portions. But no matter how much you use, the amount of uh, number of bits I will send to you will scale uh, in uh, length proportional to A, the uh, likelihood of the message that I'm sending you, and uh, with the, uh, the the strength of the correlation. If the weaker the correlation, the longer the amount of message, but it's a fixed constant factor on top of whatever I would have normally sent you. Maybe I'll, uh, I think the next slide might actually talk about this. So let me see what happens. Right. So okay, actually, I did do some color coding, but it's not showing up too clearly. That's dark, and these are light, which means that's what I'm going to talk about next. So the compression, let me just briefly tell you what the original solution uh, in uh, the paper with Juba et al. Uh, was. We said let's t like take this common randomness between Alice and Bob and think of it as if it's a dictionary. Really, now we're back to this thing. So what does it mean? So for each possible message M, the randomness, I have an infinitely long random string associated with it, arbitrarily long random string associated with it. And Alice and Bob share this perfectly. That was the original, the perfectly shared solution. When Alice gets the message M, what she will do is she'll start sending some prefix of R sub M to Bob. Okay? And the main question is where should she stop? And what will she use in determining how, how many bits she should send? She will look at her probability of the message M and she'll tell, send you logarithm of the inverse of that probability, that many bits. If she had stopped right there, the expected length of the communication would be the entropy of P. Because it's 
but she'll send two delta extra bits just to make sure that your probability, since it's not exactly equal to mine, etc., etc., she'll send that much extra. And uh, so if she thinks, if the delta gets larger, she'll send more. So she estimates the delta also, right? I mean, she says, look, I think I'm talking to a person who's this far or this audience collectively is this far from me, so I'll send, send this many extra bits per message and I send that much extra for this message. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, let me, yeah. And what does Bob do to uh, decode? He just, he just knows his distribution in the same dictionary. He looks at all the strings which have this as a prefix, okay? What Alice sent as a prefix uh, in this dictionary and he says, let me look at the most probable string under my distribution from this set. Okay, and that's what he decodes to. And then it, once you have this protocol, it's fairly trivial and easy to analyze. The nice thing about this is that this does correspond a lot to natural communication. I mean, you don't do prefixes, but in natural communication, when I say, I have to send this message across, a message being a message in my head, I say, well, if I, I could say this, but this is the likelihood with which the audience would understand. Here is, you know, experts in communication complexity. I just need to say the following. You know, I just need to say CC sub rho and then they'll understand what it is. Well, here is a slightly broader audience for them. I would have a longer string associated with the same message and an even broader audience, I'll have an even longer string. And I choose the length of the string to send based on my estimate of how far the audience is. And that's exactly what goes on in this protocol. Now what happens in our imperfectly shared randomness solution, we do pretty much the same thing, but Bob does an extra level of error correction. He says, let me look at all the strings which have this string as a prefix or even some string close to this as a prefix and amongst those pick the most probable one. So you're doing some spell check before you do the decoding and this is also fairly natural as a mechanism. This is the level of error correction that we tend to do in day-to-day -day, uh, use of uh, communication, not some sophisticated error correcting code and thing. We do spelling matching and so on. And that actually turns out that it works perfectly. It sends a longer prefix and Bob does maximum likelihood decoding after or amongst messages that are close to the received word, not just exactly equal. So as long as you're within a distance of row of the received word, you're happy with it and you use it. That's roughly what happens. So this is it. I won't do any analysis here. This works. and uh, It's a fairly easy exercise to work everything out once you do this. Yeah. How much more randomness do you need? Uh, okay. <laughs> this was infinite randomness and this is, uh, uh, all right. This, the, it's a fixed constant multiple of the amount of randomness and the fixed randomness is just, you know, the, the kind of, uh, the, the expansion that you need here is the kind of expansion that you would ask for if you had, uh, uh, if you were doing communication over a binary symmetric channel with parameter rho or parameter corresponding to rho. Okay, so whatever it would tell you, this is how much you should expand messages by, that's how much we expand messages by. So somehow the lack of correlation between Alice and Bob f behaves like it's a noisy channel uh, with the same lack of correlation between Alice and Bob. Right, so, so you take the uh, large corpus of shared randomness between us to build this dictionary and so it's not as if you choose it every time but it's as if you have a, it hardwired inside your head. It's a huge dictionary. Okay. Uh, you said product visit, but how much longer is the longer in the ISR? Uh, yeah, this is exactly based on, uh, you know, some sort of expansion which is a function of rho. Okay, okay. So, so it's a constant multiple which is a function of rho. Uh, uh, yeah, and each time it's the same constant multiple. <coughs> but that correlated randomness is exactly a binary symmetry. Right, but... Uh, we can be translated into Hamming distance. Right, but uh, we are not trying to communicate the randomness, right? We are trying to communicate the message which has nothing to do, you know, the randomness is coming from the sort of left hand side of the picture, the message is from the right hand side of the picture. But this is the side that we want to focus on, that is just an aid to our communication. But the aid, the, the error in the aid seems to ex determine how much expansion we want here. <coughs>
can't, why can't I decode? I mean, it's, I can get back to the perfect randomness assumption. Right. By correcting for the errors. In the ah, okay, great question. Okay, good, good, good. So I don't know if I talk about it explicitly here. I don't. So let me actually say one thing. A lot of times we, we have attempted to say, look, you know, we have imperfectly shared randomness. Why don't we first distill the randomness, get a perfectly shared randomness out of it, and then work with it. And it turns out that uh, that doesn't work well. Okay, so maybe on an instance by instance basis over here you could do this. So you get, but you really, you can only get a sort of a, a constant factor saving over the communication that you could think of without sharing randomness that way. Uh, and uh, here we are asking for, you know, we want to get rid of that log log n and we don't have that, uh, uh, we can't pay for it with, by just multiplying it by a small constant factor. So here somehow it manages to get rid of it uh, in all the cases. Though maybe this is not the most uh, sophisticated use of imperfectly shared randomness. This is maybe corresponding to roughly what you're suggesting. It's not, uh, uh, it's not quite that, I think. Okay. All right, so let me jump to the next example, equality testing. And uh, whoops, okay, so the whole idea over here it turns out to be, I mean, it's a, it really needs a different protocol to do equality testing. But the first step in the protocol is really the standard step, which is encode the messages in an error correct encode and think about these encoded strings and try to see if they are equal or not. But if you thought about it in the usual way in terms of having distance or some such thing, it feels a little different. What we really want to think of these as, as if they are really vectors in plus or minus one to the n. So these are unit vectors and are scaled with a slightly different norm. So vectors of the same length in some n-dimensional space. And if they are equal, their inner product between x and y is n. If they are unequal, their inner product is small. So let's, for simplicity, I just said n over two, but you know, could have been something else. Okay. So these are the vectors and these inner products are what we are trying to measure. And this is where uh, imperfect shared randomness turns out to be very good. It measures in a product pretty reasonably. Not perfectly, but inaccurately, but, uh, but not, uh, but with a controlled inaccuracy. And this sort of goes back to ideas from low distortion embeddings or some such thing. These are just vectors in n dimensional space. We don't want to send n bits, we want to project onto something. And it turns out you can actually project onto constant number of dimensions to preserve you know, this distance, either the distance between the two points is zero or it's some constant. So clearly you can project onto a constant number of dimensions that this should work. And by the way, the projections do not need to be on the same direction. They can be on slightly correlated directions and this would still be good enough. So whereas working with, uh, you know, typical binary strings, etc., etc., this imperfect sharing of randomness was killing, when you're working with real numbers, imperfect sharing of randomness just sort of thing alters things very slightly. And you can obviously go from standard collection of, you know, row correlated bits to row correlated Gaussians by just taking a collection of bits and averaging them. Take a collection of bits, average them. Now the two of us have correlated Gaussians. Okay. This works for any positive row? This works for any positive row and the correlation will be that exact same row. Okay, so these will be Gaussians with the same. So what does Alice do? She picks a random Gaussian vector in n-dimensional space and sends the inner product of the Gaussian with this x truncated to a finite number of bits. The number of bits depends basically on some calculations that we have to do. Bob compares this quantity that he's received with his own Gaussian, which is not the same as that, but it's a correlated Gaussian with y. And this works great, okay? This is somehow in mean, communication complexity, it's a very new, kind of a twist to it. So modulo some analysis, it turns out some constant number of bits suffice. And this is the uh, setting that we had first. And we thought first that this is a constant factor blow up in the communication complexity. Then we realize that, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, I mean, Bavarian et al. give a different protocol. Our protocol ends up saying Alice and Bob roughly need to have polynomial in n shared randomness. And uh, Bavarian et al. gave a natural protocol also which had two to the n shared randomness and uh, you don't have a generic result which says if you have lots of shared randomness you can use much less if they're imperfectly shared. So you, there's no general strand. So 
one protocol doesn't follow from the other by any black box means that I can see. All right. So that was the equality testing. <coughs> the, with some level, amount of work, it turned out that this was really a general upper bound. Any protocol problem which has perfectly shared randomness protocol with k bits also has a one-way complexity which is at most 2 to the k bits. And uh, how do we get this? It, roughly the idea is any communication really reduces to inner products. Okay? So if you want to think about one-way communication, Alice is going to send a k bit message to Bob and Bob is going to then look at this k bit message and decide whether he should accept or reject. So you can represent fix the randomness that they are going to use. Alice's message can be represented by an element of a universe of size 2 to the k, okay, by a single index in there. And Bob, what is he going to do with it is represented by a function which maps this universe to 0, 1. But if you do it slightly differently, I mean, so an f sub r of i sub r is the right answer over r, but you know, if you fix the r, this is the answer that they are going to compute. Okay. Now, whoops. Yeah, I think, okay, this is correct. I just sl slid that thing over a bit. Now I'm just going to go for a vector representation of Alice's message and Bob's output. Bob's output function, f sub r, can be represented by a vector of the truth table of that function. It's a 2 to the k bit string or a vector of size 2 to the k. Alice's message can also be viewed as a vector of size 2 to the k, which is a coordinate vector. It's 1 in one coordinate and 0 everywhere else. And what is the inner product that they are, what is the uh, function value that they are computing, f sub r of i sub r, it's the same as the inner product of these two vectors, right? I mean, it's the real inner product of these two vectors, because it's, this guy is one in one coordinate at zero everywhere else. That's the message. On that message, should you accept or reject, is determined by y at that coordinate. The inner product tells you exactly that. The inner product has a contribution of zero from all of these things, and one, possibly one from the one coordinate where x sub r is one. Okay, so this is trivial, but now we're back into inner product regime, and so which we know we can do nicely with imperfectly shared randomness, and so if you do Gaussian protocol over here, it'll estimate the error, uh, the same protocol that I used for equality testing, it'll estimate these inner products efficiently, it'll get a relative error of epsilon with some one over epsilon squared communication, and here, what I really need to do is get a relative error of something like 1 over 2 to the k. Because these are long vectors, especially y is a vector of norm about norm squared 2 to the k. But I want to measure the inner product to within plus or minus 1. So, so this gives me some 2 to the k bits of communication suffice. And this works out pretty neatly. So. In the rest of the talk, I'll tell you a little bit about the converse. This is probably the technical meat of the paper. And uh, it says that there is a promise problem whose one-way communication complexity is small, but the imperfect communication complexity is at least 2 to the k. This will happen provided n is very, very large. It cannot happen when n is small because then I also have a k plus log n solution. And that could be, so this will not work when k is an over 2 or something. K is very, very, very small. We didn't even measure how small. Uh, but there's, there are such functions that do exist. Okay. All right. So what's the problem uh, that we use? This is the pro result that we want to prove. The problem is probably interesting. I'll try to tell you a little bit about it and maybe give you some ideas about what goes into the proof here. The problem is, again, going to be an inner product problem. Alice is going to have a vector x, Bob is going to have a vector y, and they want to compute the inner product. And they are happy to compute this inner product to within an error of plus or minus epsilon. And the inner product is supposed to be normalized between 0 and 1. And they want to measure it to within epsilon. But the neat thing is we will work with strings where Alice is going to be guaranteed a sparse string. So very few coordinates are zeros and most, uh, sorry, very few coordinates are ones and most are zeros. Very few is like a constant fraction, a very tiny constant fraction is going to be ones and everything else is zero. So two to the minus k fraction of the coordinates are <coughs> ones and one minus two to the minus k is zeros. And Bob gets a, a vector in plus or minus one and they want to compute the inner product. Now what happens over here, and, and the gap comes from the fact that there's a promise, either the inner product is high or it's low, it's, it's the right level of uh, 
Now, why is sparse in a product easy to compute with perfectly shared randomness? So sparsity gives Alice a lot of uh, clues, you know, which index should she send? She should send, you know, she should try to send Bob the value of x sub i or some coordinate where x sub i is non-zero. If Bob looks at y sub i in that coordinate, that gives him a pretty good clue about whether the inner product is going to be positive or not. Okay. If uh, so, in particular, so so if you if you think about picking y uniformly at random from this thing and x to be a vector which is chosen randomly but supported on the coordinates where y is plus one, that would satisfy this condition. On the other hand, if x is just chosen uniformly in sparse, it would satisfy that condition. But now, if you know Alice communicates to Bob some coordinate where uh, x is non-zero then uh, Bob can easily estimate the inner product. Now how does Alice communicate this coordinate? Well they share a sequence of indices. Okay? So what is their perfectly shared randomness? They're going to share indices i1, i2, i3, i4 and so on which are uniformly random. And uh, Alice looks for the first index which is where x i sub uh, j is non-zero. Okay? So now since 2 to the minus k fraction of these indices are non-zero, you expect j to be about 2 to the k. And to communicate j, you need k bits. Okay, so you can do a compression rather than 2 to the k bits of communications, just k bits of communication. And this works out quite nicely. Perfectly shared randomness gets nice. Now, if these indices i are not shared perfectly but imperfectly, this protocol breaks down and you really don't have much to do except to go back to the standard uh, original protocol, that's what we end up proving works. So I have, I guess, 20 or uh, 13 slides. I'm not going to get to them. So let me just see if I can say something about the lower bound which would be useful. Uh, okay, so, okay, this is the, not too important. Let me just, uh, sorry, I'll just take a look at this online. And, Okay, so one interesting thing, in order to show the lower bound, we sort of reduced it to the following interesting problem. This is a problem that came up in, uh, 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 in Vijay's question as well. There's a very interesting problem that arises in the setting of imperfectly shared randomness, which is how much can you do by just reduction to perfectly shared randomness. Okay? And uh, so you could say, look, maybe you can just do some shared randomness distillation. Alice has and Bob have lots of correlation but they don't have perfectly shared randomness. Why don't they just somehow you know reduce their input to something a little bit smaller which they share exactly equally. So you can model that by a very nice communication question which is problem where Alice, uh, sorry Charlie and Dana, I mean, we just changed the names because we reduced Alice and Bob's problem to Charlie and Dana's problem. Charlie has some string R, Dana has some string S, they are row correlated and the goal is for Charlie to output some variable U, random variable, Dana can output some variable V. Both of these should be high entropy random variables, so you are not allowed to you know, output zero, both of us them can output zero and get agreement, that's no good. So no string should be output with too high a probability and we would like them to output the same value with noticeably high probability, gamma. What can you do? And we prove a simple lemma which says that with zero communication, the best value of gamma you can get is really 2 to the minus entropy, some constant times the entropy. So constant times the entropy, I mean entropy in many bits you can get trivially. Alice, Charlie just sends the first k bits of R to Dana, Dana ignores S and gets this. You can get some constant multiple smaller than k also by a slight compression uh, mechanism uh, and that compression mechanism will do very well when rho is very close to 1 and do very poorly when rho is very close to 0 but it scales sort of linearly in between or linearly in some entropy of rho or some such thing. But, uh, but that's really the best you can do. If you want k bits of entropy and rho is not, zero, uh, no, not 1 then you have to you know sort of communicate roughly omega of k bits or equivalently if they don't want to communicate the probability that they'll get it right is just 2 to the minus k. Okay. 
And uh, this already, I mean, it was very neat. I just bought this book by O'Donnell on analysis of Boolean functions. And perfectly enough, you know, all the answers we were looking for was inside that book. So, great. Uh, so, I, in fact, O'Donnell was very nice. I said, look, you know, Ryan, I bought this book, but I really need to know what's the statement of this theorem and how it's proved. He said, okay, here's the PDF. So, I have a nice large PDF of his whole book <laughs> with me. Um, and this is a, there's an easy corollary from the zero sum communication game to the C communication game where Alice and so if you had a C communication protocol you can reduce it to a zero communication protocol where Alice and Bob just guess what was communicated. Okay, they don't actually communicate, they just guess and then they look at their thing and say suppose they were so, so with 2 to the minus C probability their guesses are right and if they are right you just multiply that into the error probability and you know when we have such good uh, bounds of the error probability you can use it quite easily. Uh, the rest of the proof, I'll say it in words. Uh, the the neat thing about uh, this uh, protocol, which used perfectly shared randomness, was that uh, you know you could use the fact that you know on some coordinates, Alice is non, uh, Alice's x is non-zero, and they really heavily bias. Uh, Bob's answer, okay, or rather, sorry, the first, you know, I1, X sub I sub 1 has huge influence on the outcome of the communication protocol. Once you fix the randomness, X sub I sub 2 has next largest, and X sub I sub 3 has something. These kind of pro communication protocols where some bits of Alice or some bits of Bob have huge influence on the outcome work well with perfectly shared randomness and they do not work with imperfectly shared randomness. And the question is what's the tool which allows us to use separate, you know, very, very, you know, operations which have hugely influential variables and operations which don't. And so we went through the literature and there's this very nice body of work which is emerging again covered nicely in Ryan's book uh, on in the invariance principle. It says that there are many settings where if you're doing something and you're not letting any one of several variable influence the outcome too heavily, you can actually replace vectors by Gaussians. Okay, so instead of having zeros and ones, you could, x could be a Gaussian vector and y could be a Gaussian vector. Now, if it's Gaussian, there's no such thing as sparse. Okay, and so the sparsity goes out of the window. And once sparsity goes out of the window, there's really, I mean, two to the k bits, I mean, if you want to measure an inner product difference, of plus or minus 2 to the minus k, you have to communicate 2 to the k bits. So you could sort of work this into the calculations somewhere and so on and we managed to do this. We also got a kind of a nice uh, expl explanation of what invariance principles should look like when you try to apply it in the sense of communication complexity. We say that in the paper and so on, but I'll stop uh, here. I'll jump to the conclusions slide and see if I had anything interesting to say there. Okay, so I just want to go back to the high level thing. You know, this imperfect agreement of the context is a very important f theme. And I think really, I mean, you know, so far we've been sort of looking at it and saying it's an important question, it's an important question. This time we also found that it has mathematical depth to it. So it was very nice to see this question. Uh, it's a new layer of uncertainty and it exposes us to new questions in math uh, of the mathematical size. It also brings up this issue of scale. What should you really think of as input size? We always try to throw the context out to say, well, input size is really proportional to how much we should communicate. If you bring that back in, it's actually, the communication is always a tiny component of what uh, the input size is. And in this setting, you really have to measure communication complexity with a much finer lens. You can't just throw away a log n and say, oh, that's okay. This is, it's really important. There are many interesting questions, some coming from this question, uh, some specific questions related to imperfectly shared randomness and so on. But then I think even more interestingly, you know, can you just sort of broaden this layer of, uh, you know, like for example, this communication complexity problem. Many questions could probably con considered in the setting where Alice has input x and a function f. Bob has an input y and a function g. Bob wants to compute g of x, y. Alice wants to compute f of x, y. How do they start exchanging information? And in particular, if f and g are actually somehow close by functions. I mean, 
could be fairly interesting questions. I've not really been able to look at it carefully, but if you, you know, depending on how you instantiate the question, there may be something interesting there. Okay, right, stop. Uh -huh. Oops, maybe. Yes. Yeah, uh, does interaction ever help? So, in natural language, we know that interaction helps. Right. Uh, it's a good question. Okay, if it does help, then I'd love to hear what it does because usually. If it if it doesn't help in our case and it does help in natural language, it means there's an interesting question that remains to be modeled. Uh, from our point of view, we've not been able to come. I mean, so the, uh, assuming uh, the two theorems which I uh, didn't put down on the uh, slides, but I'm quite optimistic are true. Uh, if you have perfectly shared randomness between you and me, then interaction is very useful but imperfectly shared randomness immediately we seem to give up and we say look either uh, there was no need for randomness in which case an interaction could still be helpful or uh, we really you know I might as well send you a message and let you think about it for a long time okay so, so that's the non-interactive version of it uh, that's what we are seeing I don't know uh, whether that's the right message or not yeah how uh, in a uh, natural communication setting, how it helps, I think, would be like uh, you are trying to learn, like as you were suggesting, the model of the other person. Ah, right. Okay, that's a good question. So, 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 right. So, in compression, also, I mean, one could ask the question. So, I sent you, uh, for example, I could send you f of x. Uh, uh, sorry, this run, uh, you know, I send you the, this word from the dictionary, a certain length prefix, and the other guy could send back a thing saying, look, by the way, that was really two delta bits too long by my me me uh, measure, right? And then next time you know that, oh, look, I could have sent a smaller thing, our distributions are getting closer to each other. So, yes, uh, if you do, so, so quite often what we're doing with interactions is sort of holding down the context to make it a little bit closer to each other. Uh, that's a very interesting phenomenon, but we'd have to define the right kind of questions. Uh, I'd be very curious too. I mean, it's a very nice question, yeah, by the way. Model changes over time. Right, but most of communication, what is communication trying to do is to take your large context in your head and you listen to what others are saying, you send out some output, and your context has changed in the meanwhile. So, all of communication is just a random walk or a walk on a state space which is your context and uh, quite often you know our communication the goal of the communication is to get closer agreement on the context so that we can carry out some other conversation nicely yes that makes a lot of sense but it also makes uh, sense at the end we need both players to be able to understand the answer so I said something you said something I should know what was the you know after all the uncertainty I should get some message which I can really believe and then I can make progress with it so there's a mix th th there's some interesting uh, modeling questions over here and uh, what phenomena do we want to model and what uh, how, how to extract uh, a lesson mathematically but it could be very interesting yeah. uh, what if the shared randomness differs uh, the noise in the Right, uh, okay, good. Uh, so, so for, you know, uh, till we wrote, finished writing the paper, we never thought about that question, which is kind of a shame on me. <laughs> I should have been thinking about adversarial noise uh, all this time, and I, uh, but I never thought about it. Uh, and uh, at the moment, I'm not sure what we could do with adversarial noise. I mean, if there was a generic method which would take two strings which are close to each other and reduce them to, uh, you know, sort of something like correlated Gaussians or some such thing, that would be nice. But I don't know of a, of a clean scheme. So I don't know actually. So what might happen is. Uh, it's I, I don't want to conjecture anything right now um, uh, yeah it's it's uh, I'm a bit surprised but we never thought about it and then uh, the thing that I'd really like okay uh, th that being said I should say I mean th then the natural model would be Alice gets a random string from plus or minus one to the end uh, an adversary picks 
a masking pattern and so that and then adds the two so that Bob also marginally is at least getting random string. If Bob is not getting randomness then it's a little, I mean I, I'd be less comfortable with the model but if Alice and Bob are marginally getting uniform randomness that would be clean and then one should ask the question. So that is related to fuzzy extractors actually, the cryptography is Right. Uh, so the problem with seeded extractors is now we have to say where is the seed coming from and are they going to have it exactly. Have, I mean, You have to communicate it, right? So unless you can get away with sort of, a cost, I mean, many of these things where the we can't control the length of the randomness, and so if that turns out to scale with the length of the input, then we would like the seed to be like at most a constant number of bits, which is almost nothing can be done. So right, I mean, it's not really hard to do. Uh, anything, but sometimes you can sort of make do. So, so by the way, I mean, many of these cases, it's there's an easy solution to dealing with uncertainty, which is you get rid of it. You just ask the other person, "Who are you?" and get the answer. But most of these cases, that will be communication inefficient solution. So, you really are looking for cases where you can do better than the naive thing. And in this case, we even think of agreement distillation as a naive solution. So, if we're using, we want to have k bits of randomness. If there's a solution which takes our amount of randomness and reduces it to k perfectly shared random bits and then works with it then it's a reduction to a known problem but this is the naive solution. We are always looking for things where you can improve on this and all the solutions that we see improve on this are very naive. So it's quite remarkable that there's so much more power with imperfectly shared randomness. Yeah. All right so thanks very much.